Okay, so um, like the last sections, I'm going to break this up, break up ancient Greece into a bunch of um, different kind of subject areas as we talk about it. Um, so first off, we're going to talk about the geometric and orientalizing periods. And I will talk about the word orientalizing because I know maybe it like kind of burns your ears a little bit, it sort of does to me, but I will explain this context a little more in a second. Um, okay, so think back to the prehistoric Aegean, what we were talking about then. We have the destruction of the Mycenaean. Remember, we talked about them quite a bit. We have the destruction of all of their palaces around 1200 BC. Um, and this brings with it kind of a um, crumbling and like disintegration of social order. Um, a lot of knowledge is lost, a lot of technical knowledge, a lot of uh, cultural knowledge, a lot of history is lost. Um, how to cut masonry the way that they did, how to construct those big uh, citadels, how to paint frescoes, how to sculpt in stone. Like, it's kind of like a blank slate. Everything gets sort of destroyed and a lot of uh, that culture is lost for a long time, okay? Basically, this creates a kind of dark ages. You'll notice this in this class. We go through periods where something's a golden age and then something's a dark age. And so there, there's periods of growth and periods where everything kind of slows down, basically. So the dark age of Greece um, is around the 8th century uh, BC is when this kind of starts uh, to, to come back. The 8th century BC is when it starts to sort of come back together. Okay, so we have the Olympic Games, which I mentioned in the intro. Um, we have Homer, the, the writer that we talked about when we were looking at the prehistoric Aegean, who of course writes the Iliad and the Odyssey, so that's a big piece of ancient Greek culture. We have the, um, the international uh, trade routes kind of open up with Greece, and, and so they're not quite so isolated. And this starts impacting uh, the artwork as well. So geometric art, uh, in this period, we see the return of the human figure, which is lost for quite a while. You can see the human figures here. They're very small. They're quite abstract. Up the top, they're kind of made out of triangles, which maybe reminds us a little bit of uh, Cycladic sculpture from, from the prehistoric Aegean. Um, so we have small figures on ceramics. They still know how to make these big craters, K-R-A-T-E-R. -E That's what this open, like wide mouth, little base kind of uh, vessel is called made out of ceramics. So this particular one is the uh, Dipilon uh, crater. It's from the Dipilon uh, Cemetery in Athens from about 740 BC. This is quite large, it's about three feet tall. So for a while in this period, large vessels like this craters are grave markers. So you find them in cemeteries to mark the graves of people who have died. And it's thought that this was so that kind of offerings could be made. Um, in, in the crater, like pour some wine for your, your person, that kind of thing. Uh, craters themselves are used, um, it's a jar, basically it's just a jar or a vase with, which has a large round body and most importantly a wide mouth. And the reason the wide mouth is important is because it was used for mixing wine and water. So water, um, you know, at this point there was no way to purify it, so mixing it with wine made it more safe to drink because alcohol kills lots of things. They didn't know exactly why that worked, but that's why. Um, this particular one is one of the earliest examples of Greek figure painting, okay? Um, so, well, really quick, I want to add a little bit more vocabulary <laughs> while we're talking about ceramics. We also have an amphora. That is a two-handled, it has two big handles. Uh, kind of jug. It has a smaller opening at the top. Um, it, it's also a ceramic vessel and it's um, a jar for wine or oil. So it has a smaller opening at the top so less of it can evaporate out so it lasts longer. Um, and that's amphora, A-M-P-H-O-R-A. And then um, one of the other things I want to point out here and where we get the, the name the geometric period is if you look at the top, you see this patterning on the top that kind of almost looks maze-like. That is called the meander pattern. Kind of like it meanders like a river. Okay, um, it's also called uh, a key pattern. Okay, and it's usually around the rim. Um, and it, 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 we have these kind of circles sometimes underneath it. See the, all the little dots? And then we have this kind of M pattern, this zigzaggy kind of M pattern underneath it. Um, those are very prominent in this period. Okay. Let's look at 
sculpture. Um, so this is Heracles and Nisos. So Heracles we've heard of. This is a very famous hero in America where we like to mispronounce things. We call him Hercules, but it's Heracles is his name. Um, this is cast out of solid bronze. So if you remember, we've had bronze casting since the Neolithic period. So if you go back to the Neolithic, you'll see some, some solid cast bronze and also hollow cast bronze. This is solid cast bronze. I have a video on Canvas of how this process works that you can check out. Um, and this depicts a hand-to-hand -hand struggle between Heracles, who's the greatest Greek hero, that's kind of his thing, right? And then the centaur, whose name is ne uh, Nisos. So the story behind this, just briefly, is that Nisos, uh, who is the king of the centaurs, volunteered to carry Heracles' bride across a river. But once he gets across the river and Heracles is still on the other side, he rapes her, which is not cool, obviously. So um, Heracles kills him, you know, like you do. Uh, so this is a depiction of that fight. Um, Nisos is a, is a centaur. A centaur is a Greek invention. So we have these kind of composite creatures, you know, think back to Egypt where we have the man's head on a lion's body, that kind of thing. Um, this is a common thing that we see in the ancient world in a lot of different cultures, this sort of composite hybrid sort of creatures. Um, but the man horse, the centaur, is a specifically Greek invention. Um, be in this depiction, scale is very important. So Heracles, the man being taller than Nisos the centaur, which obviously horses are quite tall, so the centaur would have actually been taller if we were thinking about a realistic scale. The reason that he is taller has a narrative purpose. So Heracles is taller because he is the one who's victorious in this battle, in this fight between them. Okay, and you can see this is quite simplified. So sculpture takes a big step back during these kind of dark ages and then starts coming back. This is another example. Um, so this is uh, tends to be categorized more in the orientalizing style of art. So in the seventh century BC, um, we have Greek trade and um, colonizing expands as well. So the influence of other cultures increases in Greece in Greek art, especially the influence of portable works like uh, Syrian ivory carvings, so works from what is now Syria, um, which have sort of a similar kind of look to this particular piece. So the word orientalizing, oriental is a word that you don't ever, ever use to describe people. That is not a nice word to use for people. That's not appropriate, okay? Oriental, when talking about art and decorative works and things like this, is okay. It is not a slur, I promise. I would not say that. That is what this period is called. It's called Orientalizing because of the influence from the East. So don't talk about people using that word. Not cool. Talking about artworks in this very, with this, that, that very specific application is okay. All right? Okay. Uh, so, let's look at this particular piece. This is the Manticlos Apollo. Remember, Apollo is one of our gods. He's associated with uh, the uh, light of the sun and also healing and also music. So, this is a bronze statue. It's, again, a solid cast bronze statue. And it's dedicated to Apollo by the artist whose name is Manticlos. So, this is one of the earliest examples we have of an artwork being signed by the artist. He literally inscribed it. You can see the letters, the words on his thighs there. And the message that's carved into the thigh says, Manticlus dedicated me as a tithe to the far shooting lord of the silver bow. You, Phoebus, Apollo, might give some pleasing favor in return. So this is someone who made this sculpture and then wrote on it his intention, his dedication to the god Apollo, hoping that he's granted some kind of favor. Okay, let's look at an amphora. So I told you earlier an amphora is another kind of vessel that gets pretty wide and then gets little at the top so that the oil or wine in it doesn't evaporate as quickly. It has two handles because it'd be quite heavy so you can, you can carry it. Okay, uh, Corinth was a Greek city-state, and um, it is the place where we saw the most of this particular style of, uh, of pottery, of ceramics. Um, in the bands, which kind of call back to the, ceram the, uh, blah, 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 the geometric style, we have all these horizontal bands all the way up and down. 
We can see local creatures, uh, local to Greece, like boars, um, interspersed with exotic animals like lions and panthers, panthers and also Eastern mythological beasts like um, the Sphinx and the Lamassu. So we see this combination of local to Greece kind of things and things from the East, which again goes back to that orientalizing, that influence from the East coming in because of the, the trade routes, right? Uh, this is what we call black figure painting which is where the figures are painted in black. We also have red figure painting, which is where the figures are painted in red on a surface <coughs> with slips. So that's with a kind of a liquidized form of clay that is in a contrasting color. Um, and we have, this becomes really popular with Athenian painters that copy this technique. So this is originally a Corinthian technique coming from Corinth, and then it gets copied kind of all over the other Greek city-states. Okay, let's see. We'll stop there. Next, in the next bit, we'll talk about the Archaic period. Okie dokie. Oh, just really quick. This is a sphinx. So we have this like woman bird creature. And then there's a lion. I'm trying to see if there's other, there's another lion. There's a boar. So you can just kind of identify some of these creatures in here. All right. Uh, next, we'll talk about the Archaic period.